Today I talked with Jason Kander, uh, who was Secretary of State for Missouri, ran for Senate, uh, and has founded a new organization called Let America Vote. Uh, Jason is pretty young, at least by my standards, 36 years old, a rising star in democratic politics, and has already achieved a huge amount. Uh, we're going to be talking about voter suppression and what people can do to prevent it. Uh, Jason Kinder, thank you so much for uh, being able to, to talk with me right now. I want to find out a lot about what you're doing and, uh, and, and how you have been doing it, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about Let America Vote. Uh, what about that organization? What, uh, what does it do? Where is it? What's happening? Sure. So, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, Let America Vote is an organization that I founded back in February with the mission of creating political consequences for politicians who push voter suppression. Basically, we are making it harder to get reelected for folks who are making it harder to vote. And nobody's really made uh, this kind of attempt to do that before. You know, in the past, uh, all the fights for voting rights over the last 20 years or so have been really important and they've happened mostly in court, as you know. And so what we're doing is recognizing that with Jeff Sessions in charge of the Department of Justice and Donald Trump appointing judges, it's really urgent that there be a political argument as well so that the uh, the argument uh, not just be in the court of law, but also expand into the court of public opinion. And so, so that's what Let America Vote is focused on. Well, that's great. How are you actually uh, planning or how have you already begun to hold mm -hmm. politicians accountable for suppressing the vote or not allowing people to vote? Sure. So, uh, if, for instance, right now in Virginia, um, we sort of picked Virginia as the first place uh, to target because obviously it has elections this year and there's been a lot of voter suppression uh, policies that or bills that uh, Governor McAuliffe there has vetoed. Um, and they have a governor's race in about seven days. And they have, uh, in addition to that, uh, state legislative races. So we have had folks on the ground there for the last few months. We've had uh, interns and volunteers from all over the country. They've knocked on over 170,000 doors in Virginia. Um, and, uh, and I think they're making a real impact. Overall, we've had over 200,000 voter contacts. We're focused on about 10 state legislative races uh, and the governor's race. And again, just about taking folks who are uh, about vote suppression and replacing them with voting rights advocates. Uh, so let me make sure I understand, because when you're going around door to door, are you, are you saying to voters, look, this person uh, has got to be held accountable because this person has been uh, for voter suppression? Or are you saying this person who incidentally has been uh, about voter suppression and, and voting the wrong way about voting suppre voter suppression uh, should not be reelected uh, generally? I mean, what, what is the argument you're making door to door? Yeah. So it's sort of a combination of both. So, for instance, back in the legislative sessions, uh, not just in Virginia, but in other places, when bills like this are being considered, our folks are on the ground organizing, trying to make sure that pressure is put on members of, of a state legislature, for instance, about voting rights. So in those cases, our people are, are out there communicating about voting rights. Now, in the stage where we're in, uh, when you're in the heat of a campaign, our folks are, you know, we know that the people we're trying to put in office are voting rights advocates, and we know that the people we're trying to kick out are opposed to voting rights. So we don't necessarily in every case have to have our folks going door to door talking exclusively about voting rights. Our folks are out there working, putting boots on the ground to talk about the issues that we need to talk about in order to make sure that the folks who have been opposed to voting rights get kicked out of office and people who will support them are put into office. So sometimes that may be health care, it may be raising wages, it may be all sorts of different issues. But the one commonality is that we know we're putting in place folks who are going to actually do the right thing on voting rights. Uh, so this is, I mean, your, your organization, uh, even though you may not be talking about voting rights with everybody who opens the door, your organization is very much dedicated to making uh, mm -hmm. this a national movement. I mean, you're, you're not just obviously in Virginia, you're all over the country. I mean, do you right. see this as, as something that will be in every state, something that will grow into a national movement? Yeah, I mean, we're expanding into five more states in early 2018. And my whole thinking here is that when you look at issues where Republicans uh, do actually, at times, break from their party, issues like you know labor issues, choice issues, environmental issues, one of the things that all of those have in common is that there is a, a force that will stand up and oppose you in the next election if you, if you vote the Republican Party line on it, for instance. 
and that tends to sometimes motivate Republicans to do the right thing. There's no such thing as, as big voter. You know, there's there's no big voter interest group that's going to show up if you pass a photo ID law or 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 you know purge people off the rolls until now. That's what we're doing is we're we're creating those political consequences to say, look, you can choose to make it harder to vote for folks in your state, but we're going to have a whole bunch of people who show up and uh, and work against you and you may not be coming back to the legislature or whatever office you're in the next time around. Uh, so this is uh, this goes beyond uh, voter ID. It goes uh, it extends to mm -hmm. uh, gerrymandering, for example. Uh, I mean, it, it extends to all forms of voter suppression. Yeah, I mean, whether you're talking about voter purges, cutting back on early voting hours, uh, messing with voter registration. In some cases, it's just stuff people don't think about, like consolidating polling locations in a special election when, you know, you went to one place in November to vote. And then all of a sudden you live in an urban area uh, because you live in an urban area. All of a sudden, you know, you're there's nobody at your polling location that you're used to. And so they do all sorts of things to mess around with it, to make it harder for minorities, disabled folks, uh, poor folks. Uh, young folks to vote, and we're just not having it anymore. Uh, well, not only is this uh, a great idea and more power to you, but is it, tell me a little bit about your your views of Trump's commission, uh, the trumped up commission sure. in terms of voter fraud. I mean, are, are they going to make yeah. headway, do you think? I mean, what what's your, your, what's your observation? What's your, both your hope and your fear there? No. Uh, well, look, I refer to it as the Voter Suppression Committee to reelect the president. Um, because that's what it is. I mean, at the heart of the Trump re-election strategy is making it harder to vote, right? And so what this was, it, it originally, uh, as probably everybody knows, it originally was just put together to sort of justify the what I argue is the biggest lie a sitting president's ever told, which is that three to five million illegal voters voted in the election. And then it quickly morphed into uh, being focused on trying to create the justification for voter suppression laws across the country. Basically, they want to use this commission, this would be my fear, they want to use this commission to put in place laws all over the country that look like the laws in Wisconsin, where you know we've seen what happened there. So uh, that's what I'm concerned about. That's what they're trying to do. So what we have been doing is we're pushing back on them pretty heavily. We're making sure you know wherever they show up, we're there as well. The DNC created the Commission to Protect American Democracy from the Trump administration, asked me to chair it. Um, I was there at their second meeting, the other, the Trump Commission, their second meeting in New Hampshire. I was there with about 200 protesters. So we've we've really pushed back on them and, and, and denied them sort of a clear lane to run down to, to you know, present the, the lie that there's widespread voter fraud in the country when there's clearly not. I mean, there's no evidence at all of widespread voter fraud. In fact, uh, with New Hampshire, I mean, that was a very specific lie about about buses coming up from mm -hmm. Boston. Uh, do you think, I mean, is Trump going to get, you know, the, the big lie, the, the worry about big lies with regard to tyranny and demagogues in history is that if you say it often enough, the public starts believing it. Uh, do you think that, uh, that that's possible here? Or do you worry about that? I worry about it a lot. You know, I was... I was the chief election official, the secretary of state in Missouri for, for four years. So I was the chief election official in a state with a, with a GOP supermajority in the legislature. So I've seen how the voter suppression playbook works. Step one, undermine faith in American democracy. That's what they're doing with this commission. Step two, create obstacles to voting. Step three, create obstacles to the obstacles. So that's how it works. And I'm really concerned about it. And so I think it's really important that all of these lies you know, go challenged and also that we never refer to these uh, with euphemisms like, you know, a, a claim unsupported by the evidence or, you know, uh, th uh, something that uh, people have been critical of. All these euphemisms. No, it's a lie. Like when somebody lies, we should call it a lie. And every time that they do it, we should call it a lie because that is their strategy. Say yep. it over and over again. Never mind. Never mind the fact that as an American, you're statistically more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to commit, you know, in-person voter fraud. We need to point out that this stuff's just a lie every single day. Jason, how much of this is is about racism? I mean, if uh, how much do you think Trump and all of these voter suppression activities are building on uh, either conscious or unconscious racism? I think it's it's largely about that, and it's it's for political reasons. I mean, so look, the the Republicans pretend that this is a policy difference between the parties, but it's not. It's it's just a political strategy by the Republicans to win elections and. They present this fiction, this lie that, I don't want to use the euphemisms, this lie that, vo that voter fraud is widespread. And then what they do is they try and use that to 
look at you know groups like minorities, you know, black folks, Hispanic folks, and say you know that they're solving some problem by making it harder for them to vote. The only problem they're solving is because their policies are bad for large swaths of Americans, those groups of Americans are really unlikely to vote Republican. And so if they can keep those folks from voting, problem solved. I mean, the courts have said that you know, this stuff it marginalizes minority voters, which is a churched up way of saying that these bills are racist. So you are taking, I mean, you said this at the start, but I just want to emphasize this. You are saying, in effect, mm -hmm. there is a political way of fighting back, not just through the courts, but actually directly at uh, the, uh, you know, the, the politicians who are, who are voting in favor of these tactics. Yeah, absolutely. And, and don't get me wrong, like, the legal fight is still super important. I just believe that it can no longer be sort of our, our exclusive way of fighting this. We, we urgently need the political argument. And people say to me all the time, they say, but haven't Democrats, haven't voting rights advocates been losing this argument for a long time? And I always say, look, if that's the case, it's just because we weren't really making the argument in the court of public opinion. And so what we're changing more than anything else is we're going out and we're, we're making the argument and pointing out to people that this is about partisan politics. It's, it's not about voter fraud. And it's about about accountability. I mean, holding people accountable right. for who uh, don't want this democracy to work well. Uh, Jason, uh, I, I don't want to keep you too long. I, I'm just curious about how you got to where you are. I mean, you you got involved in politics. You're a rising star in the Democratic Party. I hope you don't uh, you don't worry about me saying that. Uh, no, but uh, it's quite okay. <laughs> But I'm interested, how did you get started? What, what, what kind of lit your fire with regard to politics? Uh, well, I grew up in a really public service oriented home. I mean, my, my folks were juvenile probation officers. Uh, my dad worked as a cop at night. And, and they took kids in from our neighborhood. Who, families were struggling. They took those kids in. They became what we call my unofficial foster brothers. So my folks just really at an early age showed me that when you see something that you should do, you, you should do it. You don't don't ask a lot of questions, go do the right thing. And, and then, uh, you know, as I get older, um, you know, I was in college, I was thinking about running for office and taking some steps in that direction. And then nine 11 happened. Uh, and, and actually it was after that, that I had taken some steps in that direction. And then, and then I went over to Afghanistan, volunteered to go over. I was, I had joined the army and went over as an army intelligence officer. And, uh, and really that was the first time in my life that I'd ever been on the receiving end of decisions by politicians that had a negative effect on my life. I mean, you know, I was really fortunate. I grew up comfortable. Nobody could make a decision that was going to really affect my life in a major way until until then. And and that really created the perspective that I have on politics. And, and it gave me a really increased motivation to get involved. So I, I came home and I, I ran uh, for the state legislature back in 2008. I was 27. And um, it was, you know, like every race I've had, it was a race I wasn't supposed to win. Um, but it's it's all turned out pretty well for me. And I've had the opportunity to, to really work on things I care about. And you've seen, I mean, you're, you're, you're very young, but you're old enough to see, have seen uh, a lot of the state of Missouri move, uh, move rightward. I mean, move to the Republican mm -hmm. column. Uh, do you think that it really did move that way, or do you think it's about just uh, the kind of thing we're talking about, uh, voter suppression and lies and the kind of uh, building upon and demonizing uh, people of a different race? Well, you know, it's hard to tell with Missouri because it's hard to paint a state, ba you know, politically based on a single election cycle, right? I mean, before 2016, six out of the eight statewide elected officials in Missouri uh, were Democrats. And then obviously there was a, a huge sweep. I mean, I lost the Senate race last year by less than three points, but um, Secretary Clinton uh, lost by 19 in my state. So um, it's a little hard to say. I, I think Claire McCaskill has a, has a great chance at, at getting reelected because Nobody ever made very much money betting against Claire McCaskill, and, uh, and she's working real hard. So, um, so we're, it's yet to be seen. But one thing is for sure, to get to your question, is that you know Missouri is always really sort of demographically lined up uh, with the country, and that's maybe it is definitely a little less the case over the last several years um, than than it has been, as the country demographically has changed in ways that Missouri has not. Uh, do you say Missouri? You say Missouri. I uh, I was always trained to say Missouri. Now, what's the line? Where, where is the geographic difference between Missouri and Missouri? Sometimes there's a geographic difference. Sometimes there's a generational difference. Uh, my grandmother uh, always said Missouri. But, and then I get accused occasionally of saying it both ways because sometimes, like, 
if the word after Missouri is like starts with an H, like when I was in the Missouri, so yeah, I almost did it in the, I, I can't really say Missouri House of Representatives. It just doesn't roll off. So back when I was a state legislator before I was secretary of state, I would say the Missouri House of Representatives and people would accuse me of trying to say it both ways. But uh, I don't know. It's just. It's a feel thing. <laughs> and trying to have it both ways. I, we don't have much time. I, 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 want to, I want to pursue the fact that you got into politics at such a young age. Uh, I deal because, you know, for the last 35 years, I've spent most of my time either when I'm not in politics, I've been teaching. I've been dealing with young people. What do you say to young people today when they say to you, you know, politics just stinks. I don't want to get involved. It requires too much compromise of my principles and my integrity. What's your response back? Well, first of all, the good thing is they don't say that to me very much anymore. Um, they used to. And what I used to say is, look, our generation is going to have to deal with all this stuff more than anybody else. And so we got to we got to start tackling it. Um, over the last year, I've just heard that less and less. Um, what I do hear really often is sort of I feel like a lot of the conversation that's happening in our political debate nationally is, you know, you mentioned that a lot of it is sort of a proxy for code words or sometimes not code words at all for a conversation about race. The other part of it is, I think, a conversation about whether the next generation has any promise. Right. And I feel like sometimes uh, some of the Republicans who are talking about how they want to go backwards are really kind of saying that that they don't think that there's promise in this generation. And I'm actually really optimistic about it. I've had so many people call me because they want to run for office or because they're getting involved in this generation. And also because I think a lot of the stereotypes about millennials, I'm just barely by a few months a millennial, but, but I think a lot of the stereotypes about millennials that they're entitled, that they're selfish, all come from kind of a misunderstanding of the fact that when folks want what they do between nine and five to match up with their personal identity of who they are and want to make the world a better place, I don't think that's entitled or selfish. I actually think that's pretty patriotic. And so so I'm pretty confident about where things are going. But we got to make sure that we show some progress um, because that's what would cause uh, folks my age to check out is if they put in a bunch of effort for several years in a row and then it just all stays the same. And I don't just mean winning elections. I mean the dialogue changing and becoming more real and more honest because I think that's what millennials want more than anything else. Well, I, I, I agree with you. And I think that that word you use, patriotism, is a key to it. Because patriotism is not just about, uh, you know, saluting the flag and singing the national anthem. It's about putting in the time and the effort and, uh, and the sacrifice required to make this nation better. And I've seen the same thing. Young people today are more idealistic and more willing to make those sacrifices than most generations I have taught in my life. You are just barely a millennial. I am just on the first, the first beginning of the boomers, uh, you know. My year, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, and uh, and who else? Donald Trump was also born my year. Dolly Parton, Cher. If anybody who's you want to be somebody in America, you have to be born in 1946, or your year. All right. Well, <laughs> or my. Okay. Good. Well, good. Good thing it's it's narrowed down to those, I guess. Well, Jason Kander, I want to thank you for your your uh, your time. I want to thank you for your service. Uh, and uh, want to thank you for uh, for your optimism, your idealism, and starting this organization. Good luck to you. You too. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. Appreciate it.